Okay, so I am gonna start off with the medications that everybody needs to know, both for ATI and for the boards. So the one that I always start with is DIG. Digoxin, here's what you need to know. DIG, antiarrhythmic, slows down the heart, makes it beat better. It improves the contractility of the heart muscle. So by slowing it down, beats more effectively, okay? With digoxin, you need to know, apical pulse for a full minute before administration, not a radial pulse or any other, apical. For a full minute and anything less than 60 beats per minute, you hold the dig. And under certain circumstances, anything greater than 100, I usually don't say that because we usually will give dig at one or 110 beats a minute. But ATI likes to throw that question out, you know, and, and sometimes the best answer you have is to hold that medication for a heart rate greater than 100. So just keep that in the back of your mind. When it comes to DIG, therapeutic serum DIG level, blood level 0.8 to 1.2, early signs of DIG toxicity are anorexia, loss of appetite, GI upset, so nausea, possibly vomiting, which then can progress to latent signs, which are blurred vision, green or yellow halos in the visual fields, severe bradycardia, and dysrhythmias, okay? So that is DIG. Risk factor for DIG toxicity is hypokalemia. So if the patient's on a medication that puts them at risk for hypokalemia, then you're going to watch that potassium level even more closely because they would be at a higher risk for DIG toxicity. And the antidote for DIG toxicity is DIGABIND, okay? Next group of medications, this is a classification, and that's the beta blockers, the laugh out louds, and they all share commonalities. Metoprolol, propanolol, atanolol, bisoprolol, all the LOLs. Beta blockers work by slowing the heart down first, and then they decrease blood pressure, okay? And so side effect, adverse effect, heart failure. All of them have the potential to cause heart failure. Okay, so if your patient has a new onset of pulmonary edema, you hear crackles in their lungs, peripheral edema, swelling in the feet or the ankles or the lower extremities or abdominal ascites or JVD, then they're going to stop the drug and contact the healthcare provider. Okay, okay. Uh, antihypertensives, I do these by groups because this is the easiest way to do it. You've got your ACE inhibitors, which are your prills, and the prills, side effect hyperkalemia because they're potassium sparing and a dry cough, right? Sometimes the dry cough is just annoying. Sometimes the dry cough is relentless. If it's relentless, we're probably gonna put them on a different med, okay? And then in addition to that, um, the hyperkalemia, the dry cough, angioedema is a common issue with the prills. So that swelling of that, you know, the head, the face, the mouth, oral mucosa can happen as well. The next group are the angiotensin II receptor blockers, or the ARBs. They're the sartans, thal sartan, low sartan. These guys also share the same stuff with the prills. They work on that same system in the kidneys, just a little different step. And so what you need to know about them is they also can cause hyperkalemia. They are potassium sparing, okay? So that's the big thing you want to watch out for with the ARBs hyperkalemia, okay? Then you have your uh, aldosterone antagonists, and that is one med, eplerinone. And, the, and ATI, a very, very high likelihood they're gonna ask you about that drug. And again, works on that same system in the kidneys to lower blood pressure, so hyperkalemia. So remember, your ACE inhibitors, your ARBs, and your aldosterone antagonists all work on the renin, angiotensin one, angiotensin two, aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone system in the kidneys. They all can cause hyperkalemia, but they also can affect kidney function. So you're always going to be reviewing BUN and creatinine with those medications, okay? Um, next classification of drugs, uh, anticoagulants. I'll make this short and sweet. The ones that are anticoagulants are warfarin, also known as Coumadin or Janivin, that's the oral, 
The next one would be heparin. And then the final one, enoxaparin, which is a low molecular weight heparin. Okay. Warfarin first. Warfarin is an oral anticoagulant. And when we administer warfarin, understand it works slowly. It is dosed by the week. So when you start taking it, it takes really about a week or so for the patient to become therapeutic. What does it mean to be therapeutic? Test that we do for warfarin is the PT, INR. INR stands for International Normalized Ratio. Therapeutic INR for somebody that's on warfarin should be 2.0 to 3.0. PT is prothrombin time, and that is in seconds. Usually it's nine to 11 or 10 to 13 seconds is normal. Somebody that's on warfarin, it should be about one and a half to two and a half times normal. So in other words, if the high end is 13 seconds, two and a half times that is somewhere, so two times 13 is um, 26, and then half of that seven, so like 32, 33, would be a therapeutic PT for somebody on warfarin. If you get asked a question about warfarin, it's probably gonna be either related to vitamin K, which we all know is the antidote for warfarin. Vitamin K is found in especially green leafy vegetables, but it's also found in bananas, but they're not gonna give you bananas as a choice. It's gonna be potatoes, oranges, tomatoes, um, avocados, spinach, musk melon, like honeydew and cantaloupe. Those are all things that have high levels of vitamin K in them. So you instruct your patient to eat them consistently. You can't ask them to eliminate foods with vitamin K, but you tell them if you like to eat spinach, for example, and you're gonna have spinach twice a week, you must always have spinach twice a week. Be consistent. Otherwise, INRs will be up and down and we won't know how to dose that patient, okay? So vitamin K intake, be consistent. PTINR, we spoke about when a patient is on warfarin, they cannot take any other medications that potentially could increase their risk for bleeding. In other words, if they have a headache, they don't take ibuprofen or any NSAIDs. They should take acetaminophen, okay? Um, the other thing you want to know, and this is bleeding precautions, this applies to all anticoagulants. They should never use any type of a razor. If they need to shave, male or female, it should be an electric shaver. They should always use a soft bristled toothbrush because they can have bleeding gums when they're on morphine or, or heparin or lovinox and oxaparin. They really should wear a medic alert bracelet because if they are on an anticoagulant, and they should be in some type of an accident, they're unconscious, it's great for us to know that they're on an anticoagulant. So we can administer vitamin K before we do anything in basic and have them bleed out. Okay? And that makes sense, doesn't it? All right. Um, and of course, when they talk about safety precautions with bleeding precautions, just remember, if the patient is at home, you don't want throw rugs. You want it to be well lighted. You don't want any electrical wires or cords running underneath rugs or across floors. And even if they have any small animals like cats or those little yippy dogs, they need to be careful because if they fall and they hit their head, they could have a subdural hematoma, an intracranial hemorrhage. They could bleed in their head and die, okay? Um, let's see, the next one we'll talk about is heparin. Now heparin is the fastest acting anticoagulant. Heparin can be given sub-Q or IV. So if a patient comes into the hospital and I need to make sure that they're anticoagulated now, IV heparin is the way to go because it's going to work right away. Get them anticoagulated immediately. Heparin, the test for that is PTT or APTT. Activated partial thromboplastin time or partial thromboplastin time. That test is measured in seconds also. Same rule applies, 11 to 13 seconds is normal. If they're on heparin, they should be one and a half to two and a half times normal. So what we're doing is we're making it take longer for their blood to clot, right? They're not blood thinners. Remember I said that all the time, they're anticoagulants. They slow down the process of clotting, okay? Heparin's antidote is protamine sulfate. If the patient should come in with a very high PTT 
we can reverse the heparin with protamine sulfate. Same bleeding precautions apply with heparin as well with the razor and the shaver and the soft bristle toothbrush. They should also be checking to make sure that they're not seeing any signs of bleeding in their urine, in their stool, or when they look at their skin, you should not be seeing any random echomotic areas, in other words, black and blue marks, or petechiae, those little red, they're almost like chicken peck marks. Those are signs of underlying bleeding that you would be concerned about. Um, last on this list is Lovenox, enoxaparin. That is a low molecular weight heparin, okay? That is given subcutaneously. It is not uncommon to see a patient on either heparin or enoxaparin and warfarin because we will send the patient home on warfarin, but we can't wait that full week for them to become therapeutic. We don't want them to develop a clot. So what we will do is we will put them on two meds, heparin or enoxaparin and warfarin. The heparin or enoxaparin will get them anti-coag quickly, and then we can send them home before a whole week is up on just their warfarin. Okay, so don't, you know, you very, very likely will see a question, you know, why would I be on both? That's why, right? So we don't usually send patients home with heparin or enoxaparin, but warfarin, we send them home all the time. We give these medications, these anticoagulants, A, if we are concerned about the development of a clot, so prophylactically. So if a patient is, say, a post-op patient, especially with orthopedic surgeries, we will give the patient prophylactically an anticoagulant. Um, if the patient has AFib, atrial fibrillation is a dysrhythmia in the two top chambers of the heart. That's benign. It won't kill you. But the problem with AFib is the potential for the blood to sit in the atria while the atria are fibrillating. And when blood sits, blood clots. And we don't want them to develop a clot and then once the heart starts beating normally again, the clot can travel, it can go to the brain and cause a CVA, it can go to the coronary arteries and cause an MI, myocardial infarction or heart attack, it can go to the lungs as a pulmonary embolism, and all three of those things are bad, so we don't want that to happen, okay? Um, then we have antiplatelet aggregating drugs, which aren't the same as anticoagulants, however, they are almost up there. And that the one the biggest one we talk about is clopidogrel, which is Plavix. And with clopidogrel, it doesn't slow down the clotting process in the same way heparin and, and warfarin do, but it prevents platelets from aggregating, in other words, from clumping together and sticking together, which then can form a clot. So there's not a test that we do for clopidogrel, but they will be on the same types of bleeding precautions fall safety and the soft toothbrush and the shaver, not the razor, yada, yada, yada. Okay. And last but not least, aspirin. And even though aspirin is an analgesic on the one hand and an antipyretic used for fever, it is also an antiplatelet aggregator. So aspirin is used sometimes a low dose, which is 81 milligrams, sometimes a full strength, 325 milligrams once a day, for cardiovascular issues, if we are concerned about a patient developing a blood clot, okay? Okay. I have um, a question. Okay. Um, would they ever be on an antiplatelet aggregator and a blood thinner or anticoagulant? Yes, yes. And oh, okay. it, it depends on what's going on. You won't get a question like that because that's more of a complicated thing. But, but in the real world, yeah, you could see somebody on a Plavix or an aspirin a day and also be on warfarin. So, and, and there are some coagulopathies where there's a higher risk of clotting. And, you know, so yes, the answer to that is yes, it's possible. Okay. Okay. Um, next, we have the statin drugs. The statins are the medications that are used to lower cholesterol. They lower the bad cholesterol, which is the LDL, and they also help to elevate the good cholesterol. That's the HDL, or the healthy cholesterol. Statins carry with them a big risk of something called rhabdomyolysis. So if the patient develops muscle pain, muscle weakness, muscle cramping, when they start the statin drug, they need to stop it, call the physician. 
because rhabdomyolysis can kill you. Okay? It, they should never be taken with grapefruit juice and they should be taken at bedtime. That is the best time to take a statin. Uh, another drug that we use also for hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia is a vitamin. So it's vitamin B3, which is niacin. And with niacin, it can help. It's got anti-lipemic properties. So in other words, anti-fat, so lipemic, lipids in the blood, okay? Um, niacin does have a side effect. It will cause this warm, flushing feeling. The solution to that is uh, give the patient a full strength aspirin 30 minutes before you administer the niacin, and that will eliminate that flushing feeling. Next, we have anti-anginal drugs and vasodilators. Vasodilators, the one you need to know, nitro. Nitroglycerin can be in many different forms. First, I'll talk about the rapid acting, and that is sublingual under the tongue or buccal inside the cheek. Sublingual, they're tablets. They come in a small brown glass bottle. One tablet under the tongue, every five minutes times three doses. If there's no relief after the first dose, they must call 911. They can still take the other two doses if they need them, but they should call 911 if no relief happens after the first dose. The sublingual nitro will cause a tingling in their tongue. That's normal, it means it's working. All nitro can cause a headache because of all the blood rushing to the patient's head, vasodilation. If they have a headache, they usually get better over time, but they can take some Tylenol, acetaminophen, to relieve the headache. They, nitro will also cause that warm, flushing feeling, but it's not like the niacin. They feel warm and flush because all their blood vessels have relaxed and all the blood is whoosh, just flowing everywhere. It'll pass. If their mouth is dry, they should moisten it before they put that sublingual tablet under their tongue. Uh, otherwise, it won't dissolve effectively. Um, we should know that they should also, they can also develop um, severe hypotension because of the fact that all the blood vessels are open and relaxed. Blood is flowing more easily. No sudden changes in position, rise slowly, et cetera, so that they don't fall down. Um, then we have buccal. All those same rules apply to buccal, except they don't need to moisten their mouth because with buccal, it's a little spray bottle and they simply give a squirt inside between the cheek and gums, the buccal cavity. But the same thing, one dose every five minutes times three doses, yada, yada, yada. Okay, all the same side effects, okay? And then we have nitro paste, which comes in a tube, kind of like toothpaste. And it also comes with paper, applicators that are measured in increments of quarter inch, half inch, three quarters of an inch, an inch, etc., like a ruler, okay? And the prescription will read, apply nitro paste, three quarters of an inch daily. And so you'll take the paper applicator. It's kind of like wax paper with numbers on it. You will squeeze the tube of nitro paste, knee to whatever the order reads, if it's a half an inch or an inch or whatever. You'll take that paper applicator, apply it to the anterior chest wall, cover it with a clear occlusive dressing that helps keep it in place, and it's on for the day, and then off at bedtime, and then reapply the next day usually. Just like the transdermal patch. So nitro also comes in a patch. With the nitro patch, same rules apply. The patch should be on usually eight to 12 hours a day, and then off at bedtime. With the patch and the same thing with the paste, you're gonna look for the most hairless area, okay? The less hair, the better. You're gonna always rotate sites because it will get, the skin will get irritated if you keep putting the patch or the, the paste on the same spot over and over again. Um, if they are hairy, just try to find the least hairy area. Never, ever shave a patient's body hair that exponentially increases their risk for infection. Never shave body hair. We used to do that all the time back in the day. And then we learned it wasn't the right thing to do, okay? So if it's a man with a really super hairy chest, you can trim the hair, but you do not ever shave it, okay? Um, the patch is on during the day, it's off at night. When you remove the patch and when you apply it, you should always wear gloves. You should always make sure that when you remove it, you fold it into itself 
to dispose of it so that the area that was touching the skin, right, is folded onto itself and then you dispose of it. And you must always put your initials, the date and the time that you applied it right on the patch so that the next nurse behind you knows when it went on, okay? And make sure that you've checked the patient's entire body because I promise you I have found, I had a patient that had four patches on in all different areas of the body. Gotta love that. Okay, and then we also have, there's IV nitro, I'm not gonna get into that, that's typically an ICU drug or an ER drug. And then there's oral nitro, which is typically in a capsule sustained release. Again, same kinds of effects, they can develop a headache, they can be flushed, but with the oral, they're taking it daily. So usually over time, their body will kind of adjust to those side effects, you know? Um, again, vasodilation relaxes blood vessels, lets all the blood flow nice and easy, reduces anginal pain. The oral is used for different types of angina. Believe it or not, there are different subcategories of angina. Okay, so that's that. Then we have also for angina, calcium channel blockers. The two you should know are amlodipine and diltiazem. Calcium channel blockers work on the myocardium. So they're kind of like the beta blockers. They work on the heart muscle, they slow the heart down. But instead of increasing the contractility of the heart muscle, they decrease the contractility. They're used for very specific types of anginal problems, and they also lower blood pressure. Amlodipine is also called Norvask, very common drug that's used with patients um, to lower blood pressure. Uh, we've got, let's see, calcium channel blockers. We, I think I went over everything for cardiac. All right, let's move on to respiratory. For respiratory, the ones you need to know, Montelukast, which is AKA Singulair. That is a tablet. It's given daily at bedtime. Just remember that, should be given at bedtime. Um, it's used for people, especially with chronic allergies and also sometimes to manage people with asthma, intermittent asthma attacks. So the question's gonna be, when do you give it? You give it at bedtime. Then we've got Tiotropium, which is AKA Spiriva. That is an inhaled bronchodilator. Tiotropium comes in a capsule that goes into a very specific type of MDI. And inside that meter dose inhaler, there are two little pins. So when they put the capsule in, close the inhaler, the two pins puncture the capsule. And then when they push the button, it releases this really fine powder that they have to inhale. Okay? Don't let them swallow the capsule. That's that. If you're going to get questioned about it, that's going to be the question. Don't let them swallow the capsule. It goes into the meter dose inhaler and they use it as an inhaler. It's a long acting bronchodilator. You have short acting bronchodilator. And the one you need to know is albuterol. Albuterol, prevental. Albuterol um, is the rescue inhaler, we call it. And that's the one, if somebody's having an asthma attack, that's the one that you give them. And that's going to immediately bronchodilate everything and allow them to breathe easier. You know, with asthma, you'll hear wheezing. That is the most frequent type of adventitious lung sound you'll hear with asthma. They will, it sounds musical because of the, the chronic obstruction of those airways getting really tight and the air's trying to get out and it makes that sound. So albuterol, immediate acting bronchodilator. If you're giving two, Short acting and long acting, always the short acting first, so everything's open, and then they get more of a benefit from the long acting. If they're taking in any type of a steroid, an inhaled steroid, fluticasone, you wanna make sure they rinse their mouth after they use those inhalers, or they can develop, that's right, candidiasis is what they can get. So they can get oral thrush. Make sure they rinse their mouth after they use any inhaled steroids, okay? Like fluticasone is usually the most common one that they'll ask about. Uh, let's see, guaifenesin, 
aka Mucinex. Guaifnesin is considered an expectorant, and that is the medication that thins secretions and helps the patient then cough them out. Okay, um, take it with lots of water. So, and if somebody has a cold or a cough with the flu, sinusitis, any of those kinds of respiratory problems, you want to increase fluids because fluids will also help to liquefy the secretions and make them, you know, more readily, easily to get out, easy to expectorate. Um, Antitussives are cough medicines. They make you stop coughing. They should never be used with a productive cough. So antitussives, if the patient has a dry, non-productive cough that's doing nothing, then sure, an antitussive would be appropriate. But if the cough is doing what the cough is meant to do, in other words, they're coughing up sputum, you don't want to suppress that cough because by keeping the sputum in the lungs, guess what? They're going to wind up with bronchitis slash or pneumonia. So you don't give antitussives to somebody um, that's, that's got a productive cough. The most common one is dextromethorphan. So when you see DM on that bottle of Robitussin, that's what it is. It's dextromethorphan. It's cough suppressant. Codeine is also used in, uh, there's a drug called Tessalon Pearls. Um, if you mix it with hi uh, hypnotic, it's a good, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's a joke. You don't, don't, don't mix it with hip. Um, it's bad for you. But codeine is an opioid, as you know, and just be very cautious when using that. They give it to older people a lot and it's going to make them sedated and it's gonna increase their risk for falls and injuries. So be very cautious when using codeine, you know, as, a, as an antitussive. Uh, that's gonna be it for respiratory. We'll talk about um, Noro, let's get to Noro. With Noro, the drugs they may ask you about, Baclofen, Baclofen is an antispasmodic drug. Um, it is the big gun of the antispasmodics. There are two, muscle spasm relief meds. Baclofen is the big gun and cyclobenzaprine is the little gun. Cyclobenzaprine is also known as Flexoril. So anybody that's ever gotten injured their back or their neck or anything like that on the job, Flexoril was probably the one that was prescribed. Baclofen is for more advanced disease processes that are chronic, for example, uh, MS. Right, so with MS, you'll see baclofen used very often because it will decrease the muscle spasms that those patients get because of the deterioration of the nerves with MS. Okay, um, and with baclofen and cyclobenzaprine, they both have the potential to be sedating, so you want to be sure that the patient is always safe. Um, and of course, the therapeutic effect that's the question they love to ask. The therapeutic effect is the muscle spasms have decreased, right? Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, levodopa, carbidopa, another neurological medication that is also known as Cinemet. Cinemet is used for Parkinson's disease. And, you know, Parkinson's disease, they believe has to do with, you know, um, a deficiency in um, dopamine. And so carbidopa, levodopa, can't cure Parkinson's, but sometimes can slow the progression of it down and sometimes can also make the symptoms not quite as severe. And, you know, Parkinson's is a disease that is degenerative and progressive. So in other words, once you have it, it only gets worse. Uh, and while I'm talking about it, I might as well throw in with Parkinson's, ataxia, that shuffling gait, and usually starts out with fine tremors. Those tremors then progress to more grand scale tremors, shaking. The patient will present with this mask-like face. It's almost like a blunt, like there's nothing happening, like a mask-like appearance to their face. Uh, drooling is very common with Parkinson's patients. They hypersalivate. I know there's a question in there. It, it's hypersalivation is a symptom of Parkinson's, okay? Forget it, that will be drooling. Um, so carbidopa, levodopa, therapeutic effect would be patient is able to perform ADLs. The patient is able to be as independent 
as he or she can be for as long as he or she can. But with a lot of these neurodrugs, keep in mind, the very thing that they treat, they can cause, okay? Remember that one line, the very thing that the drug treats, the drug can cause. And with Cinemet, carbidopa, levodopa, it can cause tremors. It can cause choreiform movements, which are symptoms of Parkinson's. So in other words, for some people, it will make them worse instead of better. And you'll see, because I'm going to talk about anti-seizure meds, same thing with them. A lot of them, the very thing that they treat, they can cause. When it comes to anti-convulsants, the meds that you need to know are carbamazepine, which is Tegretol, and phenytoin, which is Dilantin. Okay? Those are old school anti-seizure. In other words, they manage seizures. They are not used to stop an active seizure. If a patient is having a seizure that's lasting too long, which can cause brain damage, we can give them a benzodiazepine intravenously to stop the seizure. We can give them Valium, um, or we can give them Ativan, so diazepam or lorazepam, because PAMs are a nurse's best friend. So the benzos are used to stop a seizure, but to manage seizures, carbamazepine, phenytoin. Both of those drugs require blood work to be done on a regular basis. They both have to be maintained at a therapeutic level. And so with carbamazepine, it's five to 10. That's the therapeutic level for carbamazepine. And phenytoin um, is 10 to 20. They're on the drug cheat sheet that I put up. It's got antidotes and therapeutic drug levels. Um, again, side effects, believe it or not, increased seizure activity. Okay. These are both very old school drugs. They're very inexpensive. And so you'll see patients, especially like group home patients or Medicaid patients, will be on them as opposed to some of the newer anti-seizure drugs like Capra. But with the phenytoin and the um, carbamazepine, they too can become toxic. And again, the early signs of toxicity are pretty much the same with all these meds. They all start out with that GI upset, anorexia, sometimes nausea, vomiting. How it starts. But then with the neurodrugs, the symptoms go into a neurological progression. So phenytoin and carbamazepine, early signs of toxicity, that GI upset anorexia, later signs of toxicity are neurological, like tremors, increased seizure activity. It can even lead to coma and death. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause my recording for one minute. Okay, so since we were talking about the benzodiazepines, let me continue with them. So they are anti anxiolytic drugs. In other words, these are drugs that are used lots of things. We talked about their use for active seizure activity, they're also used for generalized anxiety disorder. So with all the benzos, there, there are commonalities, they're meant for short term use. So alprazolam, Xanax, diazepam, Valium, lorazepam, Ativan, generally used for anxiety as well. They're the chill pills. If they're used for longer than three months on a regular basis, though, they have addictive properties. And anybody who's ever known anybody that said, yo, let's get some Xanny bars, knows that they can be very addictive, okay? So if, if you are taking a benzodiazepine for more than three months, you cannot just stop cold turkey. You must titrate down off of it because you will go into a withdrawal that is physical that looks like the same withdrawal people go through with alcohol. Okay? And ironically, the treatment for alcohol withdrawal is another benzo called chlordiazepoxide also known as Librium, okay? Because whether it's alcohol on a daily basis or benzos on a daily basis, they are both central nervous system depressants. People think alcohol is not a depressant. And woo, shots, yeah. It, what happens after the third or fourth shot? 
right? So alcohol and benzos do the same thing to your system. They, they suppress the central nervous system. And if you do them every day, you're keeping your central nervous system kind of squashed. If you just stop cold turkey, you will start off with tremors that will be fine tremors that will progress, especially with alcohol, into delirium tremens or the DTs. The shaking is so bad they cannot even hold a bottle of water. It's like horrible. If nothing is done, those DTs can progress to active seizures that are grand mal tonic clonic seizures that can lead to coma, that can lead to death. So alcohol withdrawal, the treatment for the withdrawal, benzo, chlorodiazepoxide. Benzo withdrawal, benzo, usually diazepam or lorazepam, and then we will slowly lower the dose and titrate them off of it so that they don't experience those tremors and those seizures. Okay. Hmm. okay. Um, with, let me make sure everybody's muted. Okay. So the other drug that's used for anxiety, and this is something ATI likes to ask about, is buspirone. That is the non-benzo anxiolytic, also known as buspar. So buspirone doesn't have the same addictive qualities that all the, the um, benzos have. So it's being used more frequently for anxiety disorder because of the fact that all those other things, like you can take Boost Bar, you can stop Boost Bar. You know, you should titrate off a bit, but you're not gonna have that extreme withdrawal like you would with benzos where you can seize, you know, and die. Um, let's see. It, has, it does have a partially sedating quality, just like the benzos do. So you tell your patient no heavy machinery and don't go driving until you see how the drug affects you, blah, blah, blah. Um, the next category we'll go into, we'll, we'll start talking about the different psychiatric medications. So we have a group called antidepressants. And then within that group, we have subclassifications. So with antidepressants, you have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, DNRIs, tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs, and MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. That was a mouthful. I'm gonna tell you specifically, the, the MAOIs, the question is going to be about the drug, which is gonna be phenylzine, that's the MAOI that they all like to ask about, phenylzine. And it's going to be about food or diet, which is going to be about tyramine-containing foods. Because with the MAOIs, particularly, any foods that contain tyramine, and they're the delicious things that are aged, aged wine, craft beer, pepperoni, like smoked cheeses and smoked and aged meats, not steak or beef, aged like Slim Jim or beef jerky, those kinds of things. They all have tyramine. So does avocados, by the way. If the patient eats those foods containing tyramine, they're going to go into a hypertensive malignant crisis. They could die, okay? So no foods containing tyramine. There's the MAOIs. The next category, I'm gonna kind of lump them together, which is the SSRIs, the SNRIs, and the DNRIs. And they all have to do with either serotonin, or dopamine or norepinephrine, all those neurotransmitting chemicals. So, for, and these are for people with either bipolar disorder, which used to be called manic depression. So, in other words, they're either very, very happy and elated, or they're very, very sad, can't get out of bed, cry all the time, right? So, it's either severe depression or severe elation, right? By the way, when someone is manic, mania is not aggressive. Mania is, it's like somebody just smoked a big crack pipe. I know what we're gonna do. We're gonna paint the house and then I'm gonna go build some furniture and I'm gonna go the other And they're just like, yeah. And they'll stay up for days, days sometimes when they're in a manic episode. And that's a problem. That's one of the biggest problems is the lack of sleep when they're manic because they start to hallucinate without a sleep. And the fact that they don't stop to eat when they're manic and you will see severe weight loss in those manic episodes. So we can use all these different antidepressant drugs to treat these, these disorders. The one exception would be if you have somebody who's mostly manic, which by the way, is not common. 
But for people that are mostly manic, the drug of choice is all by itself. It's not in any of those categories. That's lithium. When you think lithium, you think salt, right? Because lithium is metabolized in the body almost like sodium. And hyponatremia is a risk factor for lithium toxicity. With lithium toxicity, lithium serum blood level, 0.8 to 1.2. And with lithium toxicity, yes, they can have the anorexia and the GI upset, but they appear drunk. They'll have slurred speech, like have trouble talking. And people think they've been drinking when in reality, they're going toxic. So remember that with lithium toxicity, slurred speech is one of the first signs of lithium toxicity. And that's the only time you tell a patient, eat all the salt you want, you're good. Don't decrease your level of sodium intake because that is a risk factor for you becoming toxic with lithium. All right, so back to the other categories, the SSRIs and all those guys. And there are the drugs like the, you know, citalopram, um, fluoxetine, citalopram, Celexa, fluoxetine, is Prozac, all those drugs. They all share a commonality in the fact that they can cause something called serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome is a list of symptoms that has to do with very high levels of serotonin in the blood. All those drugs by working on the serotonin and even the dopamine and the norepinephrine, they all relate back to serotonin. They're reuptake inhibitors. So they don't let the serotonin and those other chemicals get back to the brain, they keep them in the bloodstream. And the thought process is by doing that, it keeps patients' moods more stable, right? But the problem is, if they don't take their dose appropriately, or if they're on one and it's that we've given it a try for a few months and their symptoms aren't getting any better, sometimes the doctor will go to a different one. They must be off of one of those drugs for a full 14 days before they start a new one. Because 14 days is how long it takes for any of those meds. SSRIs, SNRIs, DNRIs to get out of your system. If you don't wait the full two weeks and start taking the new med, you can easily go into serotonin syndrome, which manifests everything high. Fever, high fever, hypertension, tachycardia. And the only thing that we can do as healthcare providers is treat the symptoms and wait it out and just wait for your serotonin levels to go down. There's nothing to do for it. So we just treat the symptoms and we wait it out, okay? So high fever, acetaminophen cooling blankets, tachycardia, hypertension, beta blockers, usually propanolol is the drug of choice to treat that, okay? And then we have our tricyclic antidepressants, the TCAs, and really there's only one that you need to know, and that's amitriptyline. And they're the ones, that you use a TCA when, you've tried all the others and it just seems like nothing is really helping with the patient's symptoms. Um, and I, you know, you're gonna see amitriptyline used sometimes in nursing homes with elderly people for sleep, not what it's for. It can actually, if the patient already has dementia, it can make it worse. So, but amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant and it's got, um, very, very sedating qualities, which is why you see me or why you see people use it for sleep, right? Um, okay. Real quick pause and let me get rid of this. So the antidepressant. Oh, 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 oh. I got to talk about disulfiram and I've got to talk about the um, Wellbutrin and the Zyban. Okay, hang on. Somebody who got who got booted out? Yeah, so get back in. Get back in. Uh. So two. Yeah. 
Um, and then the antipsychotics are the tocophers, tonics, which brings us to benztropine also. Benztropine. Give me one second, kids. Migraines. And Norbitrin, Lysol. One second, kids. Okay, we'll continue. Sorry. And three, two, one, go. Okay, um, the other one I want to talk about is um, a medication that is technically an antidepressant, but it's also used for smoking cessation. That's bupropion. So bupropion, name brand, trade name, you have Wellbutrin when it's being used as an antidepressant, but then you have Zyban when it's being used as a smoking cessation drug. So the problem would be that the patient sees a primary care physician who prescribes that drug for them to quit smoking, but then they also see a psychiatrist who prescribes that to them for depression or you know, bipolar disorder, and they don't realize that they're taking a double dose of the same drug. And again, serotonin syndrome is what can occur with that. Very dangerous, okay? Because they're basically double dosing on bupropion. ATI loves to ask about that drug. Make sure you don't forget it, okay? Um, let's see. We talked about benzos being used for alcohol withdrawal for the management and, or maintenance of people who are alcoholics that are trying to not drink. Once they've gone through the detoxification with the benzo, the chlorodiazepoxide, what do we do to help them not have the urge to drink? There's a drug called disulfiram, aka antabuse. Disulfiram is the one medication that requires the patient to sign an informed consent because that drug will make you vomit things that you have eaten in kindergarten if you come within a foot or two of alcohol. And not just alcohol that you drink, alcohol that's found in a lot of products around the house, like certain mouthwashes, and even some lotions and antiperspirants and deodorants contain a certain amount of alcohol. And so with disulfiram, if they come near alcohol or drink, heaven forbid, drink alcohol, they will violently, violently vomit for a long time. So then can require hospitalization. I mean, severe, severe vomit. Um, so make sure you know about the sulfuran. Uh, the next thing I will talk about, we'll go to the antipsychotic drugs. Antipsychotics are the ones that are used for psychoses. And the number one psychosis that you'll talk about is schizophrenia. And while I'm at it, let me just remind you, schizophrenia has positive and negative signs. Positive signs aren't the good ones. They're just the things that you can see. Negative signs are things that you don't really find out until you start talking to your patient. And so the positive signs of schizophrenia, number one, hallucinations, usually auditory. Typically, they will hear voices and they will do what the voices tell them to do. So auditory hallucinations. The next one is delusions. Delusions are concrete thoughts that cannot be changed. The CIA and the FBI are watching me through my microwave. They are, every day. And no matter what you say, there's, there's no convincing them that, that what they're saying is not factual. Um, I'm the queen of Spain. How come you're in Northfield? Don't you worry about it. I'm the queen of Spain. Okay. So that's, that's the delusion, the concrete thinking. And then the third is bizarre, disorganized, just strange behavior. I've had the cops bring me patients running down Pacific Avenue naked with aluminum foil on their head as a hat to block the waves from the aliens. True story. So, you know, really strange, bizarre behavior. 
just think about it too. Also inappropriate dress. If it's 95 degrees and they come in wearing a parka, probably schizophrenia. And then vice versa, if it's 20 degrees outside and they come in in a bathing suit, shorts, whatever, you know, that's a problem. So they're the positive signs, the things that you can see. The negative signs, remember the three A's. You have alosia, which is poverty of thought or speech. They basically have nothing to say. You have anhedonia. I, there's no joy in anything. Nothing brings them pleasure. And then you have abolition. I got no ambition. Those are, once you start talking to them and interviewing them and asking them questions is when you can actually assess those things. That's why they're the negative signs. You can't just see them. When people hear voices, they respond. Shut up. That's not what I said the other day. I told you to stop talking to me. No, not you, him. I'm talking to him. You will see people doing that. That is a classic schizophrenia, those auditory hallucinations. And here's a tip. One of the nursing interventions, Headphones with music, drown the voices out. Drown the voices out. That is an actual nursing intervention. Um, and the other thing too, when it comes to uh, people that are hearing voices, always ask them, what are they telling you? Because the voices could be saying, kill that nurse. And you wanna know that, that's important. You know, get a little heads up in case the guy wants to kill you, okay? What medications do we use? We use medications that are anti-psychotic meds and the ones that you need to know. Quietapine, which is Seroquel, Haloperidol, which is Haldol, and Risperidone, which is Risperdol. Those are the classics. There's also Chlorpromazepine and, um, well, let's talk about those first. So all the antipsychotics share commonalities in that the goal is to control the symptoms. We can't cure schizophrenia, but we hope to like make the voices either calm down or go away completely and control the symptoms so the patient can lead some type of a normal life. Um, but one of the most common things that you will see with schizophrenics, and remember this word, recidivism. Recidivism, recidivism means that they will, will get them stabilized on their medication, we will send them home. And they feel better because they're taking their medication. But in their mind, well, I feel better, so I don't need my meds anymore. And then they stop. And then they go back to the hospital. And we have to do it all over again. And then we send them home. And they feel better. And then they stop. That's recidivism. The, the emergency room becomes like this revolving door that they're in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Very poor prognosis with schizophrenics. Okay. So common adverse effect is EPS. And that applies to all of them. It's extra pyramidal symptoms or extra pyramidal syndrome. And EPS presents with akathesias, which are weird, awkward, involuntary movements of the extremities or the limbs. Choreiform movements, small or fine, weird movements. And then there's tardive dyskinesia, which are involuntary and awkward movements of the eyes, mouth, and face so it can start lip smacking or an oculogyric crisis which is fun to watch because this is what it looks like Let's see if i can do it do you get that you look normal anyway these are signs of eps and EPS is irreversible. So it, the onus is on the nurse to make sure that you're monitoring for any signs and symptoms of this so that it can be treated immediately. How do we treat it? Two drugs. Drug number one, benztropine, aka cogentin. Benztropine, believe it or not, is another drug that's used to treat Parkinson's. Okay, but it is used to treat EPS as well. And then the second drug that's used, good old diphenhydramine, Benadryl. They are the two drugs that are used to treat EPS. There is an NCLEX question that I had two different students get the same question. Rare for that to happen. 
uh, two students and it was with, with not the same class, but two, you know, graduated in, in this class and then three months later, a different class. The question was, you're the nurse working in a inpatient mental health facility. You have a patient diagnosed with schizophrenia. When you enter the patient's room, you find the patient pacing restlessly back and forth, mumbling to themselves, smacking their mouth. Which of the following is the priority action for the nurse? Select all that apply. And there were five choices. And three of the choices were meds and two of them were nursing actions. And the medication choices were diphenhydramine, which would be yes, benztropine, which would be yes, acetaminophen, which of course would be no. And then the nursing actions, one of them was, you know, go in and confront the patient. Never, ever, ever confront a patient that's mentally ill, ever because you do not know how they're gonna respond, right? So that wasn't it, but the other one was, announce yourself in a calm voice and direct the patient to turn and look at you. So for a moment, you know, can I talk to you for a moment, sir? Which was one of the right answers. And I had two students that remembered that question and the responses. So students will call me after they take their boards. Sometimes they'll remember a lot. Sometimes they'll be like, I don't even know what just happened. So at any rate, make sure you know those medications to treat EPS, okay? And then with chlorpromazine, which is Thorazine, agranulocytosis, right? In other words, they can become, uh, they can have low granulocyte counts. Granulocytes are types of white blood cells that fight infection. So they would be at a higher risk for infection. So you'd be watching that patient's CBC, their white blood cell count, to make sure that they're not experiencing that side effect. And then gingival hyperplasia, it's like an overgrowth of gum tissue. Once you see it, you'll know it. So the gums will actually grow over the teeth, like start to cover the tooth. So you wanna make sure that they're getting you know, appropriate dental care. Um, you never tell a patient not to brush their teeth. You, they use a soft bristle toothbrush, but they should always, you know, see a dentist on a regular basis and make sure they're providing good oral hygiene, right? So that that doesn't happen. Uh, okay, and then to continue with the neurological drugs, we can talk about migraine headaches, sumatriptan, which is also known as imitrex. That's one of the meds that ATI loves to ask about too, and the board. And with um, that drug, it can cause what's called a vasospastic response. So if the patient's taking the med and they feel chest, either chest pressure, like there's someone sitting on their chest, or chest pain that's intermittent, like it comes and it goes, stop the drug, call the healthcare provider, sumatriptan. So that's for migraines. Okay, moving on to endocrine. Let's start with, we talked earlier about Addison's and Cushing's disease. And so with Cushing's, it is either an overproduction of cortisol uh, or we've given them Cushing's because we've given them steroids for a lengthy period of time to manage something like COPD. So if that's the case where they have a, an overproduction of cortisol there's, believe it or not, not a whole lot to do, but if we're giving them steroids, we can give them breaks from their steroids, okay? Again, you cannot ever stop a steroid. When there's long-term use of steroids, you don't just stop cold turkey. They will go into an adrenal crisis, it's called. So you must titrate them slowly down off of the steroid, which will resolve most of the symptoms, okay? And then if it's Addison's so that they don't have enough, well, that's easy, we can give them steroids to help replenish what they don't have. And then diabetes insipidus versus SIADH, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Diabetes insipidus waterfall, that's the one where they will just pee and pee and pee and pee and pee and pee and pee. And so the test for that is the water deprivation test as we discussed earlier. And the problem is, is a lack of antidiuretic hormone, which we have a man-made antidiuretic hormone called vasopressin. So vasopressin or desmopressin, that is a drug that replaces 
people that don't have ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and that is treatment for diabetes insipidus. For SIADH, it's the opposite. They are retaining fluid. And so the treatment for that is diuretics, right? Things like furosemide um, or hydrochlorothiazide, any of the thiazide diuretics are used to treat that, okay? And then we have thyroid disorder. So we have hypothyroidism, and then we have hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is either idiopathic, like we're not sure why, or it can be caused by something called Graves disease. And we believe that to be autoimmune. With Graves disease, hyperthyroidism will have two specific clinical manifestations. One is exophthalmus, and it's those eyes, boing, the googly eyes, bulging eyes. And then the second is goiter. So goiter is a swelling of the thyroid gland that can actually get super big. So you can Google image uh, a picture of somebody with a goiter and, and they can get so big where they have to be surgically removed, okay? Hyperthyroidism, if you remember what one is, the other is the opposite. Your thyroid maintains your metabolic rate, okay? How fast or how slow your metabolism is running. So I always say, remember one, the other one's the opposite. So when we talk about hyperactive thyroid, everything is high and fast, high and fast. Hyperactive thyroid is high and fast. Tachycardia, hypertension, tachypnea, they're always hot. They're always hot. They cannot tolerate anything. They can't tolerate heat. They couldn't live in Florida because they would be melting. They're always hot because they're always running in overdrive. They will eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, never gain an ounce. They will stay skinny. And the problem is they can go into what's called a thyrotoxic crisis, which also known as a thyroid storm, which is just all those symptoms I just described, only amplified. So they'll come into the ER, their blood pressure will be like 240 or 260 over 120 or 140. So that they're like ready to have a heart attack. And when that happens, that's the extreme of a thyroid problem. So we've got to intervene. We'll treat the symptoms first and then decide what we're going to do to treat the hyperthyroidism. Well, what can we use to treat hyperthyroidism? Well, we can use methimazole. Okay, that's one drug that we use to treat hyperthyroidism. Or propyl theuracil. It's the second drug that we use to treat hyperthyroidism. And then the last is radioactive iodine, which is usually the last resort and is used to destroy some of the thyroid tissue, usually before we decide to take the thyroid out, okay? So hyperthyroidism, usually caused by Graves' disease, exophthalmus, goiter, high and fast, hypertension, tachycardia. They're very thin, even though they eat all the time. They can't sleep. Insomnia, they're just go, 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 go. Um, methimazole, propyl theuracil. And with those drugs, the question's probably gonna be along the lines of what, how do we know that we've reached a therapeutic effect with the drug? Well, then are the symptoms resolved? Has the patient maybe gained a little weight? Has the patient been able to sleep, right? So are the symptoms resolved? With radioactive iodine, those are treatments and it's like radiation that we use, say, for cancer to destroy tissue, thyroid tissue, before removing the thyroid gland. And once the thyroid gland is removed, the patient will be on levothyroxine, which is what we use for hypothyroidism for the rest of their life. Okay. So, because when we take the thyroid gland out, now they go from being hyperactive to hypo. Now they've got no thyroid gland. And by the way, when it comes to labs, there are three labs that relate to your thyroid. TSH, T3, and T4. There are way more than that, but the ones that you need to know are those three. If the patient's got a hyperactive thyroid, the TSH is low, but the T3 and T4 are high. Okay. Hyperactive thyroid, the TSH is low, but the T3 and T4 are high. If they have a hypoactive thyroid, the TSH is high, but the T3 and T4 are low. 
So the TSH is always the opposite of what the thyroid is doing. Make sure you remember that. Okay, that's important. And levothyroxine, which is Synthroid, that's the drug of choice for people with a hypoactive thyroid. That's a man-made thyroid replacement hormone, right? That we give, needs to be given first thing in the morning on an empty stomach with a full glass of water by itself. And they shouldn't take any other meds or eat anything or anything for about 30 minutes. Okay? So that's levothyroxine. And then next we've got diabetes mellitus. Type one diabetes autoimmune, also called juvenile, starts at a younger age, sudden onset. You're gonna get it, you're gonna get it. Has nothing to do with lifestyle. Only insulin is the treatment. Type two diabetes, onset is later in life, usually older, 40-ish, 50-ish, slow onset, can run in families. So if you have a immediate family member that has diabetes mellitus, you are automatically an increased risk, but it's not a guarantee that you'll get it. But lifestyle modifications like losing weight and watching diet and those kinds of things can help, okay? And with type two diabetes, you can start off with just lifestyle modifications. And if they don't work, then we can give you metformin. And with metformin, that's usually the first med that we give. It's an oral med that's not an insulin that works on the liver. And what it does is it stops the liver from putting sugar back into your blood. So it's used with diet modification and hopefully exercise and that kind of thing. And metformin, metallic taste in the mouth. Side effect, tell them to suck on some sugarless hard candy. And metformin can cause a lactic acidosis, which is a buildup of acid in muscle tissue that deteriorates muscle tissue. That can be fatal. Make sure you tell the patient, new onset of muscle pain, weakness, muscle cramps, stop the drug, call the doctor. And if they're having any test, a diagnostic that uses contrast dye, cardiac catheterization, CT scan with contrast, uh, angiogram or angiography, all of those things use contrast dye. They must stop the metformin the day of the procedure and hold it for two days after the procedure so that their body can excrete the contrast dye or they'll go into renal failure. You're going to be checking BUN and creatinine when a patient is on metformin, believe it or not, because even though it affects the function of the liver in, the, in that hepatic gluconeogenesis, it's excreted through the kidneys. And so it can really beat up a person's kidneys. Next, for orals, we have exenatide and a carbos. Here's all you need to know. Exenatide, it's an oral, and exenatide can cause pancreatitis as an adverse effect. Patient develops a new onset of stomach pain. That's it's pretty severe usually. Stop the drug immediately and call the healthcare provider. And then a carbose, it needs to be given with the first bite of every meal. And you want to make sure that that's when the patient is getting that drug and they can't take the drug if they're not going to eat immediately. Okay, that's a carbose. And then after that, we go to our insulins. And we've got rapid acting, which is Lispro short acting, which is regular, intermediate acting, which is NPH, that's the only one that's cloudy, and then long acting, which is either insulin glargine or insulin detamine. If you get a question about insulins, it's going to be either about instruction to the patient or it's going to be about peak time, you know, um, diet information and relationship or signs and symptoms of hypo or hyperglycemia. So with insulin, especially Lispro, regular, and NPH. The patient is at a high risk for hypoglycemia. They can bottom out. So they should always have an order for either D50, which is dextrose, or glucose. So especially with regular insulin and Lispro because they're fast acting and rapid, like short acting and rapid acting, right? So in other words, the patient can bottom out. What does it mean to bottom out? Just want to say this. A normal fasting blood sugar for a healthy adult is 60 to 110 or 60 to 100, somewhere in that ballpark. For somebody who's diabetic, you're not going to see a blood sugar, a fasting blood, su blood sugar that low. If a diabetic has a fasting blood sugar of under 100, they will be symptomatic. In other words, they will be diaphoretic, sweaty. They will maybe shake, feel anxious, 
those are signs of hypoglycemia. Because for us, a blood sugar of 70 or 80 is great. But for them, because they usually run a little higher than that, that's low for a diabetic. Okay? So make sure you understand that. And then when we talk about hypo and hyperglycemia, you know, hot and dry, sugar's high. Cold and clammy, give them candy. Hot and dry, sugar's high. Cold and clammy, give them candy. If you just remember that little line, you'll know hot and dry. People with high blood sugar, hyperglycemia, are usually flushed, feverish, flu-like symptoms. They're hot and dry, right? People with low blood sugar are usually cold and sweaty, cold and clammy. You ever get into a, like a nasty cold sweat? That's how they feel. And they'll have tremors and sometimes feel anxious. But either way, too low or too high, you got a problem if you don't do something about it. If a patient is hypoglycemic, you must give them a short acting carb, which is a simple carb, like a glass of juice, fruit juice. Don't add sugar to it ever, 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 ever. I don't care what you've seen. I know that nurses, oh, put some sugar packets in the juice. There's enough sugar in the juice because it's a simple carb. So it's going to bring their sugar up now but you have got to give them a complex carb and a protein once you get them back to a normal blood sugar for them, okay? Otherwise, they're just gonna bottom out again, okay? So the simple carbs, just remember, if it's white, it ain't right, and if it's brown, I'm down. That always makes people laugh, but I mean, it's the truth. The simple carbs are the white ones. They're the, you know, white sugar, white bread, white rice, white flour, right? And of course, anything, that's, that's a sweet, like in other words, pastries and cakes and donuts and those kinds of things are simple sugars. They go in fast, blood sugar goes up, but they're out fast, so bottom out. Just give a kid a bunch of candy. Look at kids on Halloween. They eat all that stuff and they're like, ah! And then, right, they crash because that's what sugar does. The complex carbs are the brown ones. Like if, it, if it's bread, you want to give them bread that's wheat bread or rye bread or whole grain bread. One of the best bedtime snacks you can give somebody is a whole grain or wheat cracker with peanut butter because you've got the complex carb and then a little protein that's in the peanut butter, okay? Um, so when we talk about peak and onset time and all that stuff, Lispro is rapid, 15 minutes, boom. It starts working, 15 minutes. You better make sure they got a meal tray if you're giving them Lispro. Regular insulin, only insulin that can be given IV, because all insulins are administered subcutaneously. Regular is given sub-Q with a sliding scale, or IV, the patients in diabetic ketoacidosis. So regular insulin, onset usually within, it, some books will say 30 minutes to two and a half to four hours, right? Peak is usually two to three hours. So if your patient gets up in the morning at six and they take their regular insulin based on that fasting glucometer reading, but they don't eat till eight, they're going to bottom out. And any type of exercise will make their sugar drop. Remember that people that exercise, if they go for a walk or whatever they do, should always carry with them some like glucose tablets they are chewable. That's the best thing they can carry with them in case they do start to feel like they're hypoglycemic. Um, NPH, eh, four to 14 is somewhere in that ballpark. NPH is intermediate acting. That's the one that's cloudy that you can mix with regular insulin or Lispro so that you kind of get the effect of the short or rapid acting right away. And then the NPH kind of hangs on for, you know, to carry them through the rest of the day. And that's that Nancy Reagan RN. So it's air for the NPH, air for the regular, draw up the regular, draw the NPH up last. That's the way you mix insulin. Um, and long acting insulin, the one you're probably gonna get asked about is Glargine. And even the Board of Nursing loves to ask about insulin Glargine and also known as Lantus. Insulin Glargine is a basal insulin, 24 hours. It's given usually at night, it's given by itself, never mixed with anything, and it's given without regard for glucometer reading. So in other words, what you will see is a patient is on a sliding scale with regular insulin, but then we will get them started with a long-acting insulin at bedtime because the goal would be 
to get them off the sliding scale so they're not doing this blood sugars four times a day and only have them on that long acting insulin. And by the way, the hemoglobin A1C is a non-fasting blood test that shows us how much sugar is stuck to the patient's hemoglobin over about a 90 day period. It's used not only to diagnose diabetes, but it's also used to see if the patient has been compliant with their medication regimen or if the medication regimen is working, okay? Diabetics, a normal hemoglobin A1C should be below 7%. Non-diabetics is four to 6%. Nobody will have anything lower than 4% because that would mean they're dead. There's some sugar stuck to everybody's hemoglobin. So if you see an answer that's like a hemoglobin A1C of 1%, that patient's not upright, okay? Just remember that. Um, and then just make sure you go over the uh, diabetic foot care and then diabetic ketoacidosis so that you understand you know, what's going on. Um, I am going to do an endocrine lecture, um, not today, because I'm almost talked out at this point. Uh, I think that's gonna be it for today as far as the meds are concerned, but I have a cheat sheet for the um, herbals. So I'm gonna stop recording right now, let me pause.